Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast that's dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. We're with Michael, a resident Ephesiologist, Andrew Johnson, Associate Pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas, and I'm Matt Till, Lead Pastor of Restoration Church in the Chicago Land Suburbs. Hey guys, uh, good to be with you today, and uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What a great way time to cover of both year. of your uh, way to cover both of your bases there. Yeah, well, you know, we are inclusive and we are for all peoples <laughs> and the gospel is for all peoples of all nations. So just keep Amen. your mind it, right? Hey, so uh, I just for our listening audience, I think it's important for them to know we that we have some groundbreaking information that we wish to share with them today. And Michael has just released a book on this. And uh, we went and we took a secret mission to Turkey and we did an archaeological dig <laughs> in a little town called <laughs> Ephesus. And we discovered that Santa Claus is real and he actually has his workshop is actually in an underground bunker somewhere in Ephesus. <laughs> oh, That's amazing. So it's not even in the North Pole. Not, it, we've been wrong. We've been Who wrong this whole thought? time. Who it's thought? not about snow. No. It's about heat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yes. I, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I don't know where to go with <laughs> Before we talk about myths and legends and traditions. <laughs> well, lead us off, Michael, because you're the one who wrote the book on it. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this, this has been fun. Um, I love Christmas. Our family loves Christmas. And I think, it, really, it's probably our favorite holiday. And, uh, and it's that way because um, I believe that what happened on that night or that day, whenever it was, was the most fantastic miracle ever. And and I and I'm, I I don't exaggerate. I mean, I genuinely believe that uh, Jesus's coming to this planet is the, the most incredible miracle ever. And I, I I even and maybe this is sacrilegious, and uh, m- maybe some of my evangelical friends will uh, <laughs> right back. Uh, Matt, get ready, get ready to mute, Matt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I, I think it's honestly, I think it's more incredible than the resurrection. Uh, Muted. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is why I this is why I think that because you know the Pharisees anticipated the resurrection and to some extent even uh, even the Greek philosophers were anticipating the the resurrection in some manner. It had never happened before, but at least they were talking about it. And so remember. Um, in um, Acts seven, uh, yeah, Acts seventeen, when Paul is in Athens, the philosophers come to him and they say, "Hey, he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection." And uh, the, the Greek here almost makes it sound like a name, uh, Anastasia, that there was this kind of juxtaposing of Jesus and this God of resurrection. And so it seems as if, you know, they were anticipating something to that effect. And, uh, and so it wasn't a, it wasn't, I mean, it was a surprise. It, it, and, and honestly, it was an, a miracle of miracles. But uh, it, to some level, it was anticipated. And, uh, and so it wasn't shocking when, G- when Paul was talking about the resurrection of Christ with the philosophers. But what is shocking is to think that God would come, incarnate himself, uh, be born of a virgin, and, uh, and would live among us. I mean, that is remarkable. And uh, so, it, I mean, for that yeah, maybe I'm exaggerating. I don't, I don't know, but, but for that reason, I I just love this time of year and thinking about the extent of what God did to have a relationship with us. I mean, to think about it here, and Paul again, he talks about this uh, in Philippians two that Jesus mm-hmm. takes on human form. He leaves behind his glory, this majestic position where he was and comes and takes on flesh. I mean, if that's not the most incredible thing that's ever happened in the world, I, I don't, I don't know what was or what is. Mm, mm. It's fascinating too, that we really do need, well, I shouldn't say need, but we want to try to keep refocusing back on 
uh, how amazing this is that Jesus has come because this time of year has been co-opted by so many different people and so many different issues and things that the certainty and the beauty of Christ's appearance on earth has been lost through so much. And so even you're tempted to try to say the resurrection isn't as amazing as it is because this other thing is that amazing. We don't need to downplay the resurrection by any means. It's, I think the miracle of the season has been lost. It's been, it's been missed. And so it is, is appropriate and it is worth focusing on to say, this is nothing like this has happened Mm. ever before. And that God truly would become us like us, God with us, Emmanuel, that needs to be highlighted. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be uh, internalized in a very humbling fashion. So I, I'm with you, Michael. I think it is worth our uh, spending time both talking about it and uh, really writing on your very large coattails since you have written another book. <laughs> no. uh, Matt and I are just happy to be along for the ride. No, well, you know what? This was a fun one to write. And it, in fact, I think I make mention of this in, in the preface that this is really a book that's been probably 20 years in the making. And um, you all, you guys know that my during my doctoral research, I, I studied an ancient pagan religion that was revitalizing in the West. And it was through that study that I began to become aware of the number of traditions that Christianity had co-opted from uh, the different pagan uh, traditions. And, uh, and so naturally, as I was doing this doctoral work, uh, our three children were young and of course, we'd celebrate Christmas, and and uh, so the, it created this kind of conflict between my academic self and my family self. And uh, so we wrestled with, you know, what would it look like, or how should we talk about these traditions? Um, and not just the Santa tradition, although that's certainly a, a significant one, but other traditions like the Christmas tree and decorating the tree and decking the halls with uh, bales of holly. Uh, Bows of holly. Um, Could you actually bail holly? That would be interesting. Probably painful too. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But all of these interesting traditions, mistletoe, even uh, all of these interesting mommy kissing (laughs) scene. Actually, for those who are listening, uh, you don't get the benefit of uh, what is behind Michael is his very own pagan Santa Claus. Um, and the season is here. Tis the season to decorate your office and recording space. That's right. That's right. Well, you guys had your superheroes. Or, Always. Or, uh, at least you do, Andrew. Here, here's my superhero. Here is uh, who, the Santa that I affectionately called Druid Santa. He Why do you call him Druid Santa? Well, he, he, he just reminds me of what a Druid would look like. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I can yeah. see that now. Yeah. With the long beard and, and, uh, robe and staff. And he's got a bowl of something that he's holding in his arm. Cheer. So why, yeah. wise Santa, a wise Santa. He's the, the sage. Yeah. So the book is, uh, entitled unwrapping the first Christmas. And we have Armand to thank for that title as, uh, we were batting around even the idea of writing uh, this book. And I don't even remember what preempted or what caused me to begin to think about it, but maybe we were talking about traditions or Christmas. I think I planted a seed in your mind at one point and then Uh-oh. you went with it. Okay. I'm to, right. Maybe I'm to blame. Well, I'm fair, <laughs> but I'm glad. I'm glad that you did because, um, yeah, it's an interesting time of year. And, uh, and, you know, I think the timing was right to begin to talk about some of these things. You know, for us, as we think about a physiology, uh, one of our uh, desires is to peel back the layers of Western culture that we've kind of heaped onto the, the church in the West and to get back to the first century. 
And uh, as I was writing the book, I thought, you know, that's what we're doing here, is that we're trying to peel back the layers of the traditions uh, that have, that have, you know, come uh, to, to the Christmas story and, so that we can get back to the real meaning of what the, the nativity was and understand the significance of God becoming flesh. Uh, the word made flesh and what that means for us uh, today. So, so yeah, the book was a fun uh, thing to write and uh, to reflect on even our family life and how we as parents wrestled with the, the conversations that we would have uh, regarding Santa Claus uh, with our kids mm-hmm. and the traditions that uh, we practice as a family. And we still do those pra- those traditions. I mean, we still, every year we'll go out and, uh, as I share in the book, we'll go out on the most blustery day of the entire year to find a live Christmas tree. And uh, inevitably, it, it's cold, it's windy, it's snowing, it's muddy, and we're tramping through the Christmas tree farm trying to find a, a tree, the perfect one for, for our house. But we'll bring it home and we'll decorate it and... Um, We'll put the train around the the base of it and all of those things. And and we enjoy that. It's something that we like to do as a family. Um, But for us, too, as a family, we don't want to lose sight. And I'm very thankful to the Lord that we haven't lost sight of what the meaning of Christmas is and that uh, Jesus came. And uh, this, this was God who is pursuing a relationship with us. And, uh, and he did the most incredible thing to come as an infant um, on that night that's now 2,020 years ago. Seems like when I yes. think about um, the Christmas story, but also just knowing um, as we see the miraculous birth of Jesus is that as you were even saying, Michael, like when we talk about a God who's a God on mission, this is his great missionary endeavor of entering into the space, entering into the human space uh, as himself um, and walking and living among us uh, as the, the undefiled version of us, right? Mm. To whom in which we relate to, can see, witness, and we attach ourselves to. Um, and, and obviously through the spirit, right? Um, talk to us more about what that looks like for us as we should be kind of framing ourselves in kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of even the first century by going, oh, how, how miraculous and how upside down does this even feel or sound? Mm, yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question and a great frame of mind for us to get into as we think about the, this time of year. And, 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 you know, I think the first thing that I like to do as I think about the Christmas season is to remind myself that, um, it, that uh, it, there are those traditions that have layered onto Christmas that aren't necessarily focused on Christmas. Yeah, and to and really to peel those back, um, and that starts with the the whole narrative of the nativity and what was going on um, in, in the Gospels uh, and when that was going on um, and the significance of the events that surround uh, Jesus's coming. It seems like we would have to do some some deconstruction a little right. bit um, on what Christmas is because I mean, as you just said, we think about this and go, man, we we add or we try to inject Jesus, so we try to make Jesus the louder version in all of the other versions and the other narratives and stories to which we try to tell Christmas, or which we try to communicate and describe what Christianity is, or, or why like why we celebrate Christmas and its history and its origins. And we just try to be a louder voice. We just try to be a more clear voice. We try to be a more articulate voice. But really, you, we have to deconstruct all the other narratives that have w- found its way into the Christmas story in order for us to see the the truth behind it all and to actually be able to understand it. Am I am I correct in that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, we have to go back to the uh, third century really to begin to deconstruct that because. Um, and and here's, here was the struggle that I was facing as I was doing my research and then trying to figure out, well, how do, we, how do, we, how do I navigate this academic side and the family side where we've had these traditions? And, and, um, 
and so what I learned through that process was, and, and I mean, this isn't new really for anyone, but um, uh, Christianity, Christianity has always had this desire to connect to culture. And at some points in the history of Christianity, Christianity um, uh, it became syncretistic with culture. And we see this, and it still happens in our world today. And and I, I came finally to the conclusion that in the third century, Christianity began to synchronize itself with uh, uh, other traditions. And so you have, and, and there's some disagreement on this, but you have uh, folks that will suggest that uh, Christianity actually became syncretized with a celebration that had its origin in uh, Persia, but uh, became popular in the Roman Empire in the third century, and that was the the victorious son, Sol Invictus, um, and that happened around the the, the you know the summer solstice of uh, I'm sorry, not the summer solstice, the winter. We're in winter, the winter solstice um, in uh, in December. Uh, Oh man, I just cramped. Sorry about that. <laughs> that is going to sound funny and it's going to look funny for me. <laughs> I, I just had a, uh, I did my uh, high intensity uh, interval training this morning and uh, got a little leg, leg cramp going on there. But anyway, we'll send you some Advil. Yeah. Thanks. Amazon Prime. Yeah. Um, so you said winter solstice. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, and so Christianity and its desire to be relevant uh, to the culture uh, that began to celebrate um, and usurp, in fact, these pagan traditions into the Christian holiday. And, and here's what was interesting is that there, at least I haven't found any record of a first or even a second century practice of Christmas. Um, it, it seems like the first and second century uh, Christians were not focused on the birth of Christ. Uh, they were definitely focused on the resurrection of Christ, and um, and so for the out of a desire, I suppose, to be relevant to culture and to in some way displace some of the pagan traditions. Christianity began to, in in some sense, redefine, if you will the holidays, um, the, the pagan holidays. And Sol uh, Invictus was one of those holidays that uh, took on the, uh, the celebration of the birth of Christ. Now, we've heard this story before, too, when we talk about Easter. Am I correct? Yeah, we do. I, I mean, Easter itself is, uh, the word is, is a um, Germanic word that is, um, has its root in the goddess, uh, uh, Astera. And uh, who was a fertility goddess, but but it's a little bit different in terms of Easter because of the Jewish calendar in the Passover. Sure. And so there's a you know there is much more of a connection uh, for Christians to make to that time uh, time of the year that versus time of the year. yeah. So the question is, do we have the dating right in Christmas? Yeah, and that's where I finally came to the conclusion that uh, we don't have the dating right. I mean, even the text. If, if, yeah, I know, I know. You know what? And this was this was such a a frustrating point for us. That was Andrew, family. by the way, like that weird, bizarre sound he just made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And as I'm I know. <laughs> Yeah, and we're not. I don't want to poo-poo the d- December date. You know the traditions now that have so. I mean, we're talking what eighteen hundred years of tradition for the dating of uh, of Christmas in December, the birth of Christ in December. But really, if we if we go back and look at the nativity account, it, it's interesting, and and it's Luke's account specifically. Uh, that talks about the time when Jesus was born. Mm-hmm. Eric, this is the least the most information. The most, uh, yeah, certainly the most information. I mean, Matthew's, uh, the, the two gospels that give the most information about the early years of Jesus are Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. And in Luke's gospel, you know, Mary uh, and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem uh, because of a census. And I go into these things in the book and, and try to pinpoint the dating of that census. 
Um, but the but the time period in terms of the season uh, is significant there as well because you have the shepherds who are out at night tending their flock, and that's not something that shepherds would do in the winter months um, in even in Palestine, and so it necessitates a, a later date uh, other than winter, and so it had to be either spring or or summer. And I think really the the, the date that uh, I ultimately land on is in the spring. And so Jesus is born in the spring uh, rather than in, in the winter. And in the book, I, I go into a little bit more detail about even, even uh, pinpointing more precisely the date uh, being in April. Um, but I don't want to give that away to... I would say don't give it all away. I'm not going to give it all away. Um, but that's important for us because, again, we have to realize that we've added these different layers to the Christmas story. And that's one of them, um, th- that layer that Jesus is born in winter. And, uh, and it just adds, you know, some, uh, well, frankly, some unnecessary color to the story. And uh, to be honest, I think it detracts from the incredible thing that actually happened, that God himself came. Uh, into this world, and uh, and we don't need to add to that story, uh, but we want to we want to amplify the true story of Jesus's birth. I find this is a, a fascinating sort of conversation to have, but not just now, and not just in regards to to Christmas. I think there's some things happening in our country politically, um, and a whole bunch of other things where there is a lot of distraction about other things. And so we spend our time either thinking about or arguing or being distracted by the other things. Uh, And in this case, we're talking about Christmas. And so we are going to have a discussion about what traditions around Christmas are the most harmful for us to uh, to celebrate it, or even what, what traditions are we allowed to embrace and say, this is a tradition. It may not be the most accurate thing. It's okay that we celebrate it in late December and not when probably it was in April, but we're still spending time talking about the traditions instead of the actual thing. The thing is worth focusing on. It is Jesus, God come down to earth and being born in the form of man. And we have Jesus coming, baby Jesus. Um, I mean, not to quote Ricky Bobby, but you know, thank you, baby Jesus, because we have a we have a god who came down and actually what's so funny uh both you matt and michael both launched into talking about this god who would come down in the form of man and walk and feel and do things and i'm like let's go back to when he was a baby first because that's even more incredible that he would put himself in such a susceptible position to be a baby, the, the most uh, innocent and the most susceptible and the most able to be hurt and in the care of others, like Jesus did that. Strangely, strangely, do we, you know, ask ourselves the question? Well, I don't know. Actually, we'll begin with that, but that, that took, I mean, yes, yes, and yes, and yes. But I would kind of wonder, like, wow, like it requires total dependence upon sinful human beings to care for himself. Like it happened. Whoa. Now there's a thought. (laughs) Mm, And, And that's, and that's the thought we need to stick with. And this is why, you know, uh, some of the traditions that we have surrounded Christmas about let's, let's let or not surrounded them about, we have surrounded Christmas in this. It, it is like an onion or it's like a cloak, you know, it's like layers of clothing that we have put on. And so we're spending our time arguing about, you know, was he born in this season or that season? Uh, was it an inn or was it actually a relative's house? And that was the front room of the same house that he was born in because that's where they kept all the animals at night to stay warm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of good research. I look forward to reading your book, Michael, to see if you tackle this one or that one, but I do. It, it, it doesn't 
we're, we're arguing about the wrong thing because if it's if it's distracting us from looking at this very humbling thing one of the things that strikes me most about at least uh, some of the ways that the early church talked about Jesus, uh, it was that he was regarded as divine. And so a lot of the early church had to spend time making sure to focus on the fact that, yes, he was also human. Like, we need you to realize that he came down, God came down and was human, which seems backwards because I feel today everybody's cool with Jesus being human. Mm. It's the divinity they are missing. And so today we're spending our time trying to argue, no, Jesus was divine. Jesus was God. But to actually spend our time like Athanasius saying, he was both. Like we can't miss this. And so to highlight Christmas is to highlight the humility of the baby Jesus coming, and we've got to focus on it. Yeah, yeah 100%, Andrew. And, and not only that, but I think it's to highlight the fact that Jesus, when he came, he saved. I mean, that was the announcement of the angel. Uh, it, it, you know, I bring good news to you that's of great joy for all people uh, that, that this day uh, Christ is born. And, uh, and so his saving act started then. Uh, it wasn't put off or delayed. I mean, he was born and this was the good news that needed to be proclaimed. And the shepherds took that good news and they did proclaim it. And that's uh, one of the fantastic things uh, about the birth of Christ. So are we allowed then to say, uh, we're allowed to celebrate the fact that that Jesus' arrival on Earth was the was the prologue to the eventual salvation that was coming, and they were celebrating it, knowing what was going to happen, even though it had not yet happened. Jesus you know, being born wasn't the end of the story. It, it wasn't the end of the story, but it still was. Uh, th- there was a completeness to the story. Um, in the fact that Jesus was born. I mean, that announcement is significant. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, the angel says, you know, I'm proclaiming to you good news. That's for all people. And that good news was uh, the fact that the Messiah was born. Um, And and people recognized him as the Messiah. Uh, You know, we have the the Magi coming from the East who uh, bring him gifts and they worship him in recognition that he mm-hmm. is the king. And I go into this in the book uh, as I talk about the Star of Bethlehem and the significance of that astronomical event um, it, that signified or uh, that what happened in Bethlehem on that night in in that time period was the fact that the king of kings was born and there was no doubt in the minds of these travelers from the east that he alone was the one who was worthy to be worshiped and they brought what they had and laid it at and gave it to him and so and so the, i mean that's significant um and yes you're right andrew that you know of course christ dies he's resurrected he ascends and he seats at at uh the side of the father um and those are all salvific a part of the salvific events but if we think about this um the fact that he comes when he did uh, when he was born, that is uh, a salvific event in and of itself. And so those who saw that, those who heard it, heard that good news, they were saved. Uh, the, those wise men, they were saved. They came and they worshiped the King of Kings, and they knew full well uh, who it was that they were worshiping. And so they, mm. they didn't necessarily have to wait for the resurrection and the ascension and the session to happen. They were saved at the moment that they recognized that Jesus is the King, the Messiah, the Savior, and Lord. Wow. Seems to be important here, too. This kingdom motif is so critical for us to understand that the birth of Jesus announced, announces the establishment of his kingdom, this eternal kingdom that is uh, heaven, you know, basically this, this idea of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this, this notion of that Jesus entering into the world is now the announcement and that establishment of this kingdom. 
And so it would seem as if this kingdom is, it's the eternal kingdom and it's happening present to those who unite themselves or are united in Jesus Christ. And so it's, this is the central aspect. Here's the central focus. Here's the moment. Like, this is what we've all been waiting for. This is the restoration of the world. This is the restoration of all that, that has gone wrong and is, and is wrong and broken and corrupt and, and evil in this world is now, because even Matthew, as he um, quotes, I mean, his name, should, he quotes Isaiah 7, and it's the, for to, for to us, a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, right? This, this new kingdom was going to be on his shoulder and we will call him Emmanuel, right? Or this idea of God with us. And this idea that God has come out of heaven to establish his kingdom upon this earth in which we are united with. Um, I mean, what, a, what, an, what an incredible thought, what an incredible witness, what an incredible uh, thing that we get to be a part of now in Christ. And even to have it uh, nailed down so we can't miss it is the fact that Herod wanted the baby killed because he wanted to still be king. Mm. He wanted to still be in charge because he knew the kingdom had come. If there was another king, yeah. he needed to snuff him out. And we can't miss it then. Like this is, it's not just a kingdom motif. It's not just uh, kingdom language read back into the text. It's, it's there. the real kingdom. Yeah, it's, it's, it is the real kingdom and that every subservient kingdom on the earth is now suddenly subjected to this eternal kingdom that they have no power to actually overthrow. They either have to come under it or they'll oppose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, those are great points and those are going to be your book, Matt. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think NT Wright already started that book, but that's okay. <laughs> right. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I feel like that there's just this piece here that is just so crucial for us to understand even just the wholeness of the gospel. And, and, and I think too, when we get to Christmas, we think so much of baby Jesus, my savior, um, as, as this, this child in whom we worship um, in the manger. And of course the gospels kind of lead us here because we have very little of his childhood whatsoever. Um, very few stories, and then we jump right to his ministry. So we get the birth, we get his ministry, and then we've got crucifixion, resurrection, uh, which really are the key elements to the life of Jesus. Um, however, you know, we, we, we jump right away to, you know, resurrection, which is really cru cru crucial and critically important for us, especially as we understand our eschatology and how uh, all things will come to an end and come to full uh, to fullness. Um, but this is, this is the moment. I mean, this is, this is the thing in which we celebrate as, as believers is, is knowing the divinity of Jesus, knowing the fact that he is in fact the, the rightful King who rules forever. I mean, he has established the eternal kingdom and uh, this is who we're united to. This is who our head is as the church. And he came as Andrew rightfully mentioned as this little child who, was was put under even uh, the earthly authority in some ways of Mary and Joseph and his community and those around him who who cared for him who shepherded for him you know and, and shepherded him and then at some point he rose up and now he became and he walked into the fullness of his ministry uh, to do his his uh, atoning work but we see that he was one who was to bring peace he was to be a just mm -hmm. King. He was to be a just and merciful counselor. He is one who is to bring uh, righteousness and justice into the world in which we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, continue that ministry as well uh, as we are kingdom citizens. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, we need to remember the wholeness of the gospel message and not just separate out our soteriology and just simply say we're saved and let's just distance ourselves from the rest of the world. But rather there's, a, there's an integration into the world in which we go forth. Mm, yeah, okay, okay. And, and so much then let me build off of what Matt just said and again reflecting on what Michael had said previously <clears throat> this is almost how this, this Christmas story is something that we as ephesiologists people who are going back into the text and saying this is a global king uh, this is uh, not just a king of Israel but this is the global king this is why we get to go to the nations and say you don't this is really tricky to say, I promise I'm not a heretic, that you don't have to know every single aspect of the Jesus story to believe in him as king and trust him for salvation. 
because this is how we get to look at scripture and see throughout the book of Hebrews and that hall of faith where we get to see these people who are looking forward to a savior who is coming to trust in him. They were trusting in the person and the person and the work in the coming king before he had died and saying, I know him. I know that he is coming and I trust in him because he is the real savior. And so in this season, we get to celebrate the king who came for the whole entire world and know that the world can believe in this king without having all of the Western ideology, without, without all of the trappings around Jesus, without all of the little bits of the story that we are saying, no, but you also have to know this, and you also have to know this, and you also have to believe this. We get to look at the, the coming king in the form of a baby and say, this is our savior. Yeah. And salvation it, is in him. Yeah. Amen. And that's why I think Matthew's account is so important uh, to this is because Matthew is telling us here, the, these kings are wise men, um, magi, or actually literally they're astrologers who are coming from the East, not at all related to the Jews. And, and the fact that Matthew, who is writing in Aramaic, primarily to a Jewish audience, is relating the fact that strangers are coming from far to worship Christ is just amazing. And it's, it, it gives us that indication that Jesus is not just for the Jews. He's for all people. He came for everyone uh, without discrimination. And that is so important for us to, to understand. And it's a wonderful message that we carry around the world. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book, uh, too, was, you know, I've had the wonderful opportunity to travel in many places around the world, and, and sometimes during the what we call the Christmas season, and inevitably, I'll walk into somebody's home or into a church and see a Christmas tree decorated, and sometimes even I can remember being in one uh, country in South Asia, uh, where um, people are very hostile to Christians. And here there was a Christmas tree with English in English on it uh, saying Merry Christmas. And I thought, you know, that just seems so out of place. Mm. And you can be in places, um, you know, in Hindu, uh, majority Hindu world places or Buddhist world places, or even in communist atheist places where shopkeepers will have Christmas ornaments and uh, decorations and Santa Clauses and so on. And, and here is all this, these really primarily Western traditions uh, for Christmas that you see uh, in places where they have absolutely no idea who Christ is and what the significance of this season is about. And so I wanted to write this book, especially for uh, folks living in those contexts so that they could see that, you know, there is something significant to this story that we tell. Um, and if we can peel back the traditions and the legends uh, surrounding uh, the, the practices um, then maybe we can get to the, the truth of what we see in the Gospels and the significance of yeah. that event for all people. And so, Michael, do, how do you feel like as we think through this, um, is, there, is there a place for this kind of, I mean, it sounds like you're making a case this is a place for contextualization. And we need to kind of peel back some of our Western presuppositions, our Western culture, and not impose the Christmas tree, the Santa Claus, all the gift giving, things like that into the purpose of Jesus. But it seems like that we have, in many regards, taking the imagery of this birth of Christ and, and integrated it into other types of culture, cultural norms or things and you know, other sorts of traditions that we have somehow kind of molded into all of this. I mean, is it wrong in which we, you know, decorate the Christmas tree? Is it wrong that we, um, you know, have a, a mythical in individual of Santa Claus that kind of brings the, to the stories, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. Oh, Druid, it's Christian. horrible. Druid Santa. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, where's the place for that? And, and how do we balance it? And even taking it a step further, how do we engage the world um, 
with this message? Yeah, and those are the questions that I'm trying to address in the book, uh, th- just through our personal experience as a family and how we wrestled through some of these things. You know, and ultimately we landed on uh, the, us still celebrating these traditions because there are they're traditions. I mean, they grow up out of a European culture. And, um, and so we can celebrate that. And there's history there to it. But w- what's concerning to me is that we export that as well. Mm. Um, there was not too long ago uh, a 60 Minutes program on about China and the, the, um, the, the, the uh, Christmas ornaments that are made in that country. Um, and they make more decorations for Christmas than any place else in the world. And, uh, and yet they have no idea, the people that are making those ornaments, they have no idea who Christ is. And yet they'll still celebrate Christmas um, because that's what, how the West has done it. And that's what's concerning to me is that um, we're, celebrating, we're celebrating Christmas in a way that, to be honest, is foreign to Jesus. He, he would, I, I, I mean, he just does not recognize what Christmas has become in the Western world. And that's, I think, largely due to commercialization. Um, the Santa Claus has played a huge part of that, thanks to Coca-Cola. Um, but, uh, boy, if we could just get back to the simplicity of that Christmas story and what happened on that night uh, that was so remarkable, I, I think it, uh, it would do us well to redirect our attention away from you know, the myth of Santa Claus away from even the gift giving. And there's nothing wrong with receiving gifts or giving gifts. But uh, what those things tend to become distractions to us. And um, in some way, at some level, distort the significance of the greatest gift that was ever given. I mean, there's, there's nothing that compares to the gift of eternal life. And, uh, and yet we try to make up for that, don't we, through the gifts uh, and the, the, the sense of pleasure uh, and satisfaction we might feel from receiving something that we've anticipated for an entire year. Um, but, but if we can get back to understanding that there's nothing that compares to the gift that Christ provides, not just for those of us in the West, but for all people uh, worldwide. I think there's, I mean, there's something, ah, so many things to think about. So one thing that you said, Michael, and I think I'm, I'm echoing Matt in a different way. Isn't that what we are doing with ephesiology is asking that question is what we are doing even recognizable to Jesus? Mm. Cause that sort of question isn't just applicable to Christmas, which again, you've already established if this wasn't even, a, this wasn't even celebrated in the first century maybe not even in the second century. Uh, so the answer obviously is no, it's long not recognizable to Jesus, but how much of what else we are doing in the church through music, through preaching, through the gathering on Sunday, how much of what we are doing is unrecognizable mm. to Jesus? How much is missing the point of exalting him as the risen savior, uh, the, the honored and glorified king? How much of it are we missing? Now, I want to put that question and maybe, you know, I I shouldn't say we'll talk about it later. That's what we talk about every week. So that's, you know, that's not something that's untouched territory. But I do also think something that you touched on is uh, in embracing the true story of Jesus as King come to earth, God with us, Emmanuel, the, the King for the whole world, in embracing that, that at least least allows us in the West to not, quote unquote, feel bad for enjoying the gift giving and the gift receiving part. Because we are allowed to say, it's okay to enjoy that. It's good to give. It's good to receive. But I am also still celebrating this risen Lord. And I want to allow uh, the things that are going on. Like you said, it originally uh, rather... um, How do we bring it back up and celebrate Christ? How do we use something that's in our culture and point it towards Jesus? Like, that's what we want. And and so we can't, we don't have to always feel bad 
for liking some Western things because we're in the West. Let us embrace the coming of our Lord in the form of a baby and point to him as the inauguration of the king and that this starts, but enjoying it too. Yeah, in the meantime. yeah, yeah. You know, so like, as you're saying, I, I was kind of having the same thoughts too, um, Andrew, and I, I feel like we're getting to a place, even in our own culture and even within the church, where I feel like we're, we're we have, we have li- lived in this place, especially with, in the world of evangelicalism, we have lived in a place where it is us against the world. And so what has happened is that we have engaged in culture wars. And so what we try to do is we, we have failed to try to, you know, we try to dim- put down Santa. We try to put him away. We try to elevate Jesus above all these things. And, and again, I think some of these, these dialogues are coming out of that tension that exists of we have a Western identity. We have white Western culture that includes Santa Claus, right? We have to admit that, that that is part of our culture. We have a culture. This is part of who we are. This is part of the identity that has come out of our history and out of our traditions, out of our legacy. And yet we have this other tension of Jesus. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to meld the two together or we can't, but rather I think we're getting to a place where I think it's, it, we're going to have to be okay with just separating the two. Can, yeah, can we right. live in the world, but can we live in the world, but not of it? Can we, I mean, can we celebrate Santa and, and gift giving and then take a step out of the side and say, now, like we are going to celebrate, we're going to focus on Jesus. What were we going to say, Michael? You're yeah, like, yeah, right. Uh, well, you know what? It, uh, again, I, I'm, I don't want to poo poo Santa. Uh, I mean, he's, yeah. he is a dear figure in, <laughs> he's a dear family. friend of yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's right back here. We, on found, my shelf. we found his, we found his underground bunker in Ephesus. Uh, yeah. Right. That's right. It, you know, but there are some issues I think um, with Santa himself and, mm-hmm. um, and, and because you think about it, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, because one of the things that we were wrestling with as a family is what do we tell our children about Santa Claus? And especially me thinking, you know, I'm doing this research and I'm having this kind of academic struggle in my head, you know, how do I effectively and gently uh, help our children to understand who Santa was and, and uh, or it is, um, it, uh, and, and what does that look like? And so um, I can remember as we were doing this that uh, we finally made the conscious decision that we're, we're going to come clean on Santa and just to admit straight up to our children that he's just not a real person. And there's no way to get around that, uh, you know, because if you think of him and you hear how he's described, I mean, he's – you know, of course, the jolly old uh, fella that um, knows when you're good or bad. And so there's a right. sense of, of omniscience about him. Um, he, he, um, he, he is apparently on, omnipotent uh, because he can uh, do these incredible feats. Uh, you know, you, you know, imagine this going around the entire world. In the well, yeah, evening, right. And there are all those, the kids. Right? Well, and that's the danger is like, because what, what I think we were trying to, what we were trying to protect ourselves against from is becoming pluralistic and still worshiping the God of Santa and the God of G and the God of the universe. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we need to avoid from happening is that we can't sit here and bow to the God of Santa who is not real when we have a real God who came and made himself known into the world in the name of Jesus Christ. And he is the one in whom we worship. Amen. Right. Amen. Yeah. So, and that's what we were wrestling with is because I mean, right. we almost build up Santa as this divine figure. Right. That has these qualities that we see in Christ himself, you know, but can there still be a place for the tradition is really what I'm asking is, can there be a place for the tradition in which we as white Western Americans, uh, and I'm just, using that because there's the three of us who are white and we're Western, right? But can, is there a place in your for white that? voice in my very white voice? Uh, can, can we still, can we still have a space for the tradition of what we have made Christmas out to be in a consumeristic standpoint yet know and separate that in our minds and in our hearts from the true purpose and the true reason of the season. I think this has been the tension that which we've heard in the Christian world for many, many years. Well, I think, okay, so this is a two-fronted, hmm, this is a two-fronted question because in a way, let's start, look, 
that requires us to look at the traditions. So, so in asking your question, Matt, that mm -hmm. doesn't then mean we need to embrace all aspects of the Christmas traditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, my wife, dead serious, we decided early on we weren't going to say that St. Nick or Santa Claus was real because we wanted credit for the presents. We wanted the, our kids to know we gave them those gifts and no It's my hard-earned money dang on straight. the table and yeah. underneath that tree. Well, most yeah. definitely. So well, you know, uh, they, we they, said we're going to... Yeah, I'm sorry. I, yep. I, just, I also want to say like there is that... The question you're asking is we can't then say all the traditions... Are, are, you know, every aspect of Christmas we need to fight for because, and I use that word intentionally, you know that it is a problem and it has gone too far when a presidential candidate runs with a campaign promise to put Christ back in Christmas so that Christmas Christians can feel good about saying Merry Christmas again. Mm -hmm. We have gone too far if Thank we you, have all... We have, we have gone way too far. If people are like, mm, yeah, that's right. I need to elect him to be my president so I can feel good about saying Merry Christmas. That is ridiculous. So and stick it to you. <laughs> Merry Christmas, jerk. Uh, it's uh, you, fil you filthy animal. Yeah, filthy, filthy animal. animal. Thank you. Yeah. Merry Christmas, you filthy yeah. animal. Sorry, you, I was really passionate, up, Michael. You yeah. were. No, you were absolutely. Well, you bring up a good uh, um, issue with gift giving and, uh, and with Santa. I mean, Santa, right, he gives the gifts to the good children and presumably bad children don't get gifts or they get chunks of coal in some traditions. That sounds and very grace-based. Well, yeah. Well, here's the thing: is that it's what happens in our there house. Are, <laughs> I don't understand what the problem is. <laughs> there are oh, I don't know how many uh, uh, millions of of Christian children around the world. Uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of two billion Christian children, and uh, but many of them, and in, in fact, probably the majority of them, live in places where income is not that uh, significant. And parents cannot afford gifts. And so if you have this Santa tradition that he gives gifts to good children and you have children living in poverty that don't receive gifts, what does that communicate to them? That they're not. There is, there is so, a great song. I think we've got a, mm, maybe, maybe we shouldn't link it in the show notes, but there is a great song called Dear Santa. And it uh, was played constantly on the Bob and Tom show. And you've got the comedian singing the first part of the song of Dear Santa. And it's like, you know, somebody in the rich areas asking for all of these super expensive, lavish gifts. And then it's got another person asking Santa, who's from a very, very poor country, <laughs> like, Dear Santa, can mm. I have clean water mm. for a week? Like, and that's like the big gut punch punchline of the song each time it comes to a person who is from a very mm. non-western context and a non-lavish uh place to say thanks santa but i i actually just want a roof over my head i want clean water like there is so much about the the western santa mythology that i am with you michael saying we do need to strip away a whole lot of this because the more that we purport it or the more that we push it up then it clouds our God of grace who gives gifts to all of his children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it confuses the Christmas story. I mean, um, it, you know, Christmas is not just, it, it, it is not any longer just a Western holiday. It's global. And many people will celebrate Christmas, but uh, the majority of them don't have a clue about who Christ is. And they'll connect Santa with with Christmas more than they would uh, Jesus, and so I think that you know continuing to propagate the Santa myth uh, confuses uh, the whole Christmas story, and uh, and uh, yeah, and for that reason, I don't think it serves us well uh, to talk about Santa. What uh, other traditions do you feel? I was going to ask this earlier, but I think this is more natural now. What are the traditions or what are some of the major tradition, Christmas tradition points do you feel are the most dangerous? 
but uh, uh, well, I think leaning on. yeah, the the main one I think really honestly is the Santa Santa tradition. I, I think that is the most dangerous to the vitality of the Christmas message. The others, like I said, they're I mean, there are longstanding traditions of the Christmas tree, and in spite of the fact that there are uh, uh, ancient references to evergreens being brought into the house as a symbol of eternal life and uh, those trees being decorated with candles and lights um, to keep the tree spirits from coming outside of the tree to uh, negatively impact the family. Um, I, I mean, those are, those are things that, that uh, Christianity was able to supplant. But, but, um, and I think that now uh, with, you know, centuries and centuries of tradition that um, I personally don't have a, an, an issue with those types of traditions and celebrations. Um, but the Santa one, you know, just because that is uh, a more of a recent phenomena um, and, and it is very much a commercialized uh, phenomena. And, and, you know, of course, there are those that will tie uh, the modern Santa Claus back to uh, a man named St. Nicholas, who was born in the late 200s and, and died in the mid 300s, um, who was a very uh, uh, apparently prominent Christian, a bishop of a church in uh, what today is uh, the southern coast of Turkey. And uh, we have we do have record of him. Uh, we have a, a wonderful what's called a hagiography or writings about the saints right. um, that talks about some of the things that he did. And he has these characteristics that are just wonderful characteristics for any Christian to have, and characteristics such as generosity, um, characteristics such as uh, taking a stand for social justice. I mean, Nicholas was known to be a defender of the poor and the weak and um, the powerless. And those are wonderful characteristics for all of us as believers to have, and we can celebrate those. And in fact, as we were wrestling with this as a family, that's uh, what I finally shared with our children, was that Santa Claus, while he is a myth, uh, th th he was based on this guy that uh, we call St. Nicholas, who lived uh, back in the, the, the uh, uh, third and fourth centuries. And, um, and, and these were his characteristics. And so we can celebrate those and it, we can try to emulate those in our own lives and be generous and stand for justice and, and those types of things. Um, and, and for our kids, you know, it's interesting. Our, our daughter and I were talking the other day, and, and she said, you know, I don't remember ever believing in Santa Claus, ever. I mean, she just has no memory that we ever talked about Santa or... You, you know, monster. Yeah, right. <laughs> but she has a very vivid memory of talking about St. Nicholas <laughs> and, uh, and how he became more prominent in terms of th this historic figure who we would want to uh, live our lives after uh, because he was a follower of Christ and uh, he lived his life in sacrifice and in service to Christ. And again, I think it helps us to remind us as to what is the purpose of Je of the birth of Jesus. What is the purpose of Christ's ministry? What was, I mean, w we, we lose this focus. We, we get into this season and suddenly it's about, spending money, gift giving, and this intertwining weirdness of Santa, St. Nick, and Jesus, and whatever else we want to throw in there, right? And so we forget, and, and I mean, when we think about the purpose of Jesus, when we think about the purpose of the establishment of his kingdom, and what it is that he does and has done for us, but, in what, and, but also what he's calling us into, Right, what we are being united into, what we are being adopted into. I kind of go back to Luke four. Now, this is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So now he's grown up and uh, thirty years old or something like that, and and he pull, he's in the synagogue and he pulls out the scroll, right, and he's at the place of and he says and he reads the place out of Isaiah and he says, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor." He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
And he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I mean, like this is, if we, if we want to have a Christmas spirit about anything, would it not be this? Would this not be the, the, the crucial text for us to go to or one of them? Because he shows up with that in focus. Like yes. when he is born, that is his purpose. That's, you know, he's reading prophecy. So when he comes, that is that prophetic voice, that prophetic expectancy is over his head. It is with him. It is fully imbibed. So when he comes, that is what he is proclaiming, even on Christmas Day. But he can't read or talk yet. So he says it then in Luke 4. Like, this is so, it, this is absolutely built into who he is and the spirit that he calls us to uh, be filled with. Actually, then uh, we, we embody. And so we then, like you said, we point to St. Nicholas. We don't worship him. We say, this is what happens because Jesus has come, because right. the king has been here. We then get to act like St. Nicholas and love and bless and care for the poor and lift up the marginalized. And this is what we do. Amen. 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 And that there is the spirit of Christmas. <laughs> so glad we got there. <laughs> yep. Well, this has been fun, guys. And um, uh, just uh, this has been a great, great dialogue. And we look forward to um, uh, reading the book. And Michael, how can our listeners uh, get access to this? Yeah, great. Well, it's available now uh, in an ebook form. Uh, you can go to Amazon.com and search for Unwrapping the First Christmas and look for me as its author. Um, and then it'll shortly here in the next few days be available in paperback. And we're hoping that it'll be available uh, for our listeners and others to, uh, to purchase and perhaps even use as a, a tool to share with their neighbors uh, to, to open up a conversation about the, the original Christmas story. And so that should be available hopefully uh, before t- too long so that that uh, it'll arrive at your homes uh, before the, the actual December 25th, the day that was. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. So again, uh, look forward on Amazon.com. Uh, Michael, will there also be a, a link on the Physiology website? We will put a link on the Physiology website uh, as well as on our Facebook page, everywhere that we can. All right, Physiology.com. That's where you can uh, find access and get to unwrapping Christmas. Um, and Unwrapping so, the first Christmas? I'm sorry, unwrapping the first Christmas. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that um, Merry Christmas to you our listeners and uh, to Michael and Andrew uh, Merry Christmas to you guys I, I believe Merry for our, our thank you and for our listening audience as well just as a, a, a heads up I think a bit of a programming note uh, we're going to be on a bit of a few week hiatus during the holidays and so uh, we'll be looking forward to picking back up our regular weekly podcasts uh, in January right after the first of the new year and uh, we, this would be a good opportunity for you to go back and listen to any of those missed episodes that you haven't gotten caught up on yet uh, over the holidays. We encourage you to do that. And um, we've had some really great ones and exciting ones uh, as well to be talking about and dialoguing through. And uh, so for uh, Michael, Andrew, and myself, uh, Merry Christmas to you. And uh, we look forward to being with you on the next Physiology Podcast. <laughs>